believe it or not, the guy the, the, the guy failing in a lawsuit is currently in jail. Uh, Do you ever find people mispronouncing it, Tezos? You don't want to fight. You don't want to fight the trend here. I would say the reason to choose Tezos is stability, and the engineers who work on integration really love using some of the languages that we had to uh, to develop smart contracts. That's not true. They didn't have smart contracts <laughs> in ancient Greece. Platform being built that was volunteer to earn money, and I thought, isn't that just working? <laughs> do, work to earn. To earn, do work to earn money the killer app for cryptocurrencies yeah you will you, you want to do a you want to do a, a pincher and bitcoin is not forced to be uh it's not forced to be evil there are a number of layer one blockchains and each has a novel approach to solving the trilemma i spoke with arthur brightman the founder of tezos about what they're building how they solve this problem and what he's looking forward to in the future. He had a lot of different takes than other founders that I've spoken to in the past. So I think you're going to find this conversation extremely interesting. Stay tuned. That's dope. That's dope. Where did the name Tezos come from in the first place? Well, I mean, there's two origins. Uh, one is that you said that it's uh, I mean, a smart contract in ancient Greek. Uh, I've, I've said that a couple of times. And then, you know, some people either laugh, some people say, oh, yeah, sure. And then some people say, that's not true. They didn't have smart contracts in ancient Greece. Um, the other uh, the other origin is that there's a freedom. It was a freedom in name. Tizzles.com was a freedom in name. It was pronounceable and it was only five letter long. And if you can write a, uh, if you have scripts, to download the list of available domains. And if you can parse or rather the list of taken domains. And then, you know, you take the complement of that and you look for a domain name, which is uh, pronounceable. So maybe not, uh, you know, you alternate vowels and consonants and five letter, that's that's a good name. And Tezos doesn't mean anything in any language. You know, like if you find a uh, pronounceable five letter.com, it probably doesn't mean anything, uh, which means if you find, if you search for Tezos, that's the only possible Tezos. Do you ever find people mispronouncing it Tezos? Well, I don't think it's mispronunciation because sometimes the Cornell pronunciation, uh, there's two schools of thought. Uh, both pronunciations are fine. I say Tezos, but a lot of people say Tezos as well. So obviously you saw a gap in the market or a reason to build this in the first place. Can you give a bit of background, I guess, your history and how you got involved and then why you decided to launch your own Layer 1? Sure. Uh, and they were even called you know, Layer 1s at the time. They were called uh, cryptocurrency or altcoins. Uh, but uh my, my my coming into crypto was that because it was an intersection of a lot of things I was interested in, uh, you know, namely uh, theory of money and finance, uh, uh, computer science, distributed systems, cryptography. So all of that, you know, was in, was into Bitcoin. And looking into this, the, the thing that struck me was there was a lot of innovation coming in, a lot of new ideas about privacy, about smart contracts, scaling. How was all of this going to fit into Bitcoin? And the ethos of Bitcoin started out by saying, will adapt whatever is the best technology. Bitcoin is a ledger. It's not a, an algorithm. And then that changed over time. And I saw there was a lot of reluctance in adopting some of the ideas from smart contracts or um, from for, for privacy. So this got me thinking into the governance problem that was at the heart of this. You know, How do you maintain a system decentralized while still able to upgrade technologically? Because the notion of an upgrade at the end of the day is subjective. You know, Not everyone might agree that something is an upgrade. So how do you build that in? And that's the idea for Tezos, which was bringing a lot of innovation in terms of smart contract, proof of stake, and um, other ideas, but doing so in a way where uh, the participant in the ledger would have a voice and would have a, a way of controlling uh, how it evolves. Uh, that makes perfect sense. So how do you differentiate yourself in this space? Obviously, you kind of alluded to the fact that layer one wasn't a term back then. Now, obviously, yeah. when I go to the Tezos website or talk to anyone who's building in this space, we start talking about Web3. Which also wasn't a yes. term back then, right? No, that's the thing. It's like I hear people say, oh, yeah, you know, like we, we need some Web3 developer. And I'm like, please don't. I mean, look, it's a fine term, but don't say this like this, this, this is a term that, that, that has been in existence for more than a year. You know, uh, the first people was the, 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 the first people using Web3 was a Web3 foundation. Uh, but, but, but now it's basically everyone is using it. So uh, the widespread usage is probably like a year old at most. How specifically does Tezos address the trilemma? Obviously, I think that's what everyone's trying to solve when they develop in this space. Yeah. So if you look at what validators do on a, on a blockchain, they do three different things. One is they order transaction. They say which transaction came before which. And that sounds pretty boring, but actually that's, that's the art of avoiding double spends. Um, the second thing they do is they make the data available. Again, 
pretty boring. You say, well, you know, sure, the data is here. No, but actually it's technical, but it really matters that you're able to uh, verify the chain. And for that, you need to download it. Uh, and the third thing, which sounds like the most uh, important one, but is actually the easiest one, is the execute transaction and validate what's going on. So the way you solve the trilemma is you unbundle all this. Um, you move the execution to specialized nodes, and you can do that with rollups. So essentially, you say, okay, now you don't have to execute anything. Execution is going to be separate, and you'll just verify that the execution was correct, as opposed to executing yourself. You unbundle data availability by doing techniques like data availability sampling, where every validator downloads only a small shard of the data. And then you're left with just ordering those shards of data, which is fairly lightweight. So that's how you solve the trilemma with uh, rollups and data availability sampling. And does that still have the same level of security as a proof of work blockchain, for example? Listen, I know your answer probably, but I'm yeah, obviously it's worth discussing. <laughs> well, the, the, there's two things. One is like proof of work versus proof of stake. And then there's, you know, scaling beyond that. And I think those things are orthogonal. Like everything that I described, you could do on a proof of work blockchain. You could do rollups, you could do data availability sampling. Uh, or, and you can do on a proof-of-stake blockchain. So setting aside the issue, do you lose security properties by doing this? Not really. If, if you're using optimistic rollup as opposed to ZK rollup, you're losing a little bit of security uh, in a sense that censorship by validators become a little more problematic, but you can make this really, really man, mi minimal uh, as a disruption. Uh, and with that availability sampling, you don't really lose. Uh, you don't. You don't really lose anything at all. So statistically, it's, 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 it's almost nothing. So no, you don't really lose uh, any property in terms of decentralization and censorship resistance in, uh, in doing that. And if you were talking about proof of work versus proof of stake, I think you gain a lot of security properties by doing proof of stake as opposed to proof of work. I think it's more resilient, more decentralized. It's better on almost every aspect. Well, you have to assume that's why Ethereum decided to make the move from proof of work to proof of stake and why it's been so built into their plans for years, right? Well, yeah, I mean, this, they announced they were doing proof of stake in 2014, and that's why you see decks from Henderson Orvitz that show like Ethereum proof of stake 2014. No, they, they meme themselves into proof of stake blockchain for like eight years before actually doing it. And why do you think it took so long? I mean, there obviously I've spoken to people from the Ethereum Foundation in the early years, and they say the proof of stake just wasn't ready, you know, at the time, in their opinion. And then I think yeah, you sort of once the train gets rolling, it's really hard to uh, to stop the momentum. I think it's a convenient excuse because the entire rest, the rest of the entire industry moved to proof of stake before that, and 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 we saw a lot of uh, value being secured by proof of stake. So, it was clearly there. Um, I think they took a very convoluted pass to uh, uh, to proof of stake, and you know for a while also because everyone. Look, I heard a lot of people say that Ethereum was proof of stake before it was. So in some sense, you know, if you have the benefit of being considered proof of stake without actually doing it, why would you bother? <laughs> yes, that, that's a that's a fair fair assessment. And one question that I love to ask founders: When you came up with the idea, you decided to actually create Tezos. Did you view it as a one chain to rule them all sort of scenario that you would take the entire market, you would be able to do everything just on this chain, or did you view it as complementary to the other existing chains, a multi-chain world, so to speak? So I, I don't think we necessarily end up with a one chain world. Uh, in a sense that there may be multiple chains that survive, but it's not because they're complementary. It's mostly, you know, the way you can think about it is imagine that you're cooling down a uh, you're cooling down a liquid with a with a solution in order to form crystals, right? If you cool it very 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 quickly, you're not even going to get crystals. You're going to get a, a glass. You can try this at home. Um, take some water and sugar, cool it down. If you cool it very quickly, the sugar falls out of solution. You don't get any big crystals. If you cool it very very slowly. You get very few crystals because you have the time to get into the minimal energy configuration, which is just like one big crystal. And if it's in between, maybe you end up with like a few big crystals. So I see the same thing happening in, in, in blockchain. The minimal energy configuration, the thing that's the most efficient from an economic perspective, uh, is probably a single blockchain to roll them all. However, we don't have a perfect cooling schedule, and uh, we may end up with different clusters, which mean, you know, which can maintain their own network effect. So I do think we we have several blockchains in the in the future with some sort of power law, but not because they're complementary. At the end of the day, I I did think that uh, the whole point of having a, a blockchain is to be as big as possible, to have as much network uh, effect as possible, and encompass everything. Well, when you say they won't be complementary, it obviously implies that they will be competitive. Uh, yes. So do you see it as each blockchain finds its ideal use case 
one becomes the metaverse chain, one becomes the NFT chain, one becomes the DeFi chain? Or do you think that they're all competing in every single genre? I think they're all competing in every single genre in a sense that there's no technical specialization that you can do that's going to make you better suited for a use case than another, than another. Little bit, but not that much. And mostly because the trailer may can be solved, right? If you couldn't solve scaling, if somehow scaling had to happen at the expense of, let's say, decentralization, you might find trade-offs. You might say, okay, you know, we'll have a chain that has more throughput, but less centralization. So you could have a, a curve, I would say, of pushing existing. But if you can solve it at the end of the day, not really, you can't really specialize yourself for one application, which doesn't mean that you don't end up with like one chain for DeFi, one chain for uh, Metaverse uh, or other things because um, there are more than technical reasons for choosing a chain. There are ecosystem reasons. Who else is using it? What is the audience? What is the integration? How well supported is it by middleware vendors, by, by wallets? So there's a lot of uh, distribution and infrastructure which... Uh, matters for application. And that, however, can be very, very specialized, right? You know, let's say you want to uh, be big in gaming. If you have all the gaming SDKs and you're integrated in a lot of games and uh, and there's a lot of infrastructure built up around this, that makes you more suitable for a game, but not because of anything the L1 does itself, but more about what exists in the ecosystem. So it's about the community and where the focus ends up being and the market effectively decides, but it's not really something technical at an infrastructure level. That's absolutely right. And much more concise than, than, than I put it, yeah. And that leads obviously to the question of interoperability, because if we believe that the chains are somewhat competitive, then perhaps we don't need them all to speak to each other and to work together. Yeah, and, and many people mean different things by interoperability. Uh, some people will say that if you have the same programming language or the same data convention, you're interoperable. Uh, that would be the weakest version of interoperability. Like, oh, okay, maybe you can use the same tools. The strongest being that your state is portable so that like one blockchain is aware of the state of another uh, of another blockchain. This implies using bridges and bridges are naturally brittle. So in some sense, it's hard to get this level of um, interconnectivity between, between chains and preserve security at the same time. But yeah, at the end of the day, I, I think there's a lot of competition that's going to happen. And when, pe if and when people build interoperability, it's not because they believe in the bright, you know, multi-chain future is always strategic. I mean, it's become abundantly clear that the bridges are brittle, right? I mean, every yes. single exploit and hack that we seem to hear about in 2022 is a bridge exploit of some kind. That makes you wonder, is this a inferior technology we need to stop and find a new way? Or is it just early and the bridges will get there? Well, there's, there's bridge and bridge. So uh, a simple solution to build a bridge is to have some, is to have a federation for example, a five out of eight multi-sig. And say, oh, that, that sounds good. And then you realize that the bridge for um, Axie Infinity was hacked by a group tied to North Korea. And if your threat is an actual nation state, you know, with people who can break in uh, secure facilities and all of that to steal your keys, that becomes a lot harder to pull. You have other bridges based on light clients. So that's, for example, what you see in the Cosmos ecosystem where the bridge have light clients with each other. Now, that is much more um, secure than a, than a multi-sig, but it depends on the chain. If you have a chain with only a few validators, at the end of the day, it's not that different from a multi-sig, right? If you have like, uh, if three out of five validators basically control your bridge, control your, your chain, it's, it's, it's the same thing as if you had multi-signature for, for a bridge. So a little better, not necessarily much stronger. Um, you have things like the Rainbow Bridge from near is interesting as well, based on a light client. Uh, but the strongest version, I think, is what you get with rollups. Like one way to think about rollups is that rollups says you have another blockchain that runs on your blockchain with a secure bridge because it settles on uh, on a chain. So in some sense, you get this interoperability by running multiple rollups on one settlement layer. Is that the future of scalability? I mean, the, obviously, the term rollups, everybody's talking about it now. It's sort of the hot button item, and which really, I think, everyone started talking about it last year. Yeah, still yet to see it. Uh, I think at its full potential, obviously. But do you think that that solves all of our scalability issues, or is this just one more step? I think it solves them very large. I mean, there's there's two aspects. It solves the computation aspect. You need to solve the data availability separately. Uh, but yes, I think it solves the computation aspect and it's the right solution. But you're right. We don't see many rollups out there. Um, there are products that build themselves as rollups, like for example, Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, 
or you know zk rollups in the form of, of starkware but if you look under the hood uh there's a lot of centralization and multi-sig hack actually happening so yes in theory there's rollups but all of them have centralized training wells around them so is decentralization a myth then in blockchain it sounds like every time we talk about decentralization we eventually run into some fully centralized aspect like you said the multi-sig or of course I don't know, it's being built on Amazon Web Services and we're dealing yeah. with uh, their cloud technology. Seems like uh, it's very hard to be truly decentralized. It is, and decentralization is a cost. Uh, you have to think about decentralization as an insurance policy. So, you know, it's painful to pay the premium, especially when you don't see any houses on fire. You're saying, well, like, well why should I pay the, uh, the fire insurance premium? Uh, you know, my competitors aren't paying the fire insurance premium and they're fine. And if I, if I pay this, I'll go slower. And if there's a fire, we're all going to burn anyway. So I think that's how people uh, think about that. You don't see the difference until there's an actual fire, uh, in which case, you know, for the longest time, people might think a multi-sig is fine until you have nation states that start hacking multi-sigs. And all of a sudden, if you're Polygon, for example, and you have, you know, your security depends on a five out of eight uh, multi-sig bridge and you have a few billions in your bridge, you start getting a little sweaty and think, well, maybe I need to be decentralized, actually. Yeah, that that makes perfect sense. And obviously, decentralization, decentralization are a spectrum, right? But yeah. is it possible to be fully decentralized by all definitions? Or is that just? Yeah, I uh, think so. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's always going to be a matter of degree, right? And you have a version of decentralization, which is um, the de jure decentralization saying, well, there's no privileged actor in the system. Anyone can participate. It just so happens that we only have three validators. So, you know, you're technically yeah. decentralized, but not de facto decentralized. Yeah. Uh, I think the most important thing is to make decentralization not relevant, right? It's like if you build a bridge and you say, well, my bridge is secure because I'm going to have a decentralized set of validators around the bridge. The best solution is if somehow you don't rely on the central, if the bridge is unconditionally secure. So remove decentralization whenever you can, as much as possible, not by centralization, but by replace it with cryptography whenever you can, because cryptography is more is more sound than uh, than relying on people not colluding. And that's actually what you get when um, when you build this, uh, when you build a system, you don't really depend on decentralization for the security of uh, uh, of the execution of a rollup, you depend on the existence of a single honest party. Now, I much prefer the existence of a single honest party then the idea is that it's hard to compromise 50% or 60% and like 50 or 60% are going to be honest. You know, and rather the assumption that only one party is honest. Uh, and yeah, re reduce what depends on the centralization as much as possible. I think the irreducible part is ordering transaction. It's a consensus. That's where you're going to have this honest majority assumption and need decentralization. But as much as possible for the rest, build optionality as opposed to decentralization. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think we have plenty of problems with the existing infrastructure and scalability and the market. Obviously, we see blockchains going down, the bridges, the hacks and exploits that we've talked about. But on the other hand, we want to see a billion, two billion or three billion people using blockchains and adopting this technology is it possible at that scale? I mean, we already see the fastest and lightest and cheapest blockchains not working when an NFT is launched. Well, I mean, right? partly is because people also want to break the laws of economics and it's tough. Uh, a lot of people wanting to launch NFT, they have this idea, they want incompatible things, right? They want to give away their NFT for cheaper than it's worse, right? And that's the first thing. And two, they don't want to have an identity system. So in some sense, they are creating a situation where there's just more... You know, there's just more demand and supply at the at the clearing price, and of course, you're gonna you're gonna get a glut uh, at this point. This thing is always going to happen. Now, your chain should still the, the chain should be unaffected by this, but you're always going to be some disruption on the uh, on the user end. And fundamentally, you either need to have an identity scheme and you say like, okay, well, based on who you are, you get it or you don't, or you need to set a price where you're gonna actually like equalize supply and demand. So that's that that's the fundamental problem, I would say. Uh, but yeah, it's possible. I, I think it's possible to handle to 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 onboard billions of people. Um, definitely, we need better technologies than what's uh, currently being deployed on uh, on blockchains. But fundamentally, you have billions of people using the web, and uh, and the web works. Right. So is that just a natural evolution that the space will scale to 
basically accommodate the amount of people that are trying to use it. I mean, it's fun to talk about a billion people right now, but you could argue there's not even 10 million people in the world actively using this technology on a day-to-day basis beyond speculation, right? And listen, I'm yeah. a huge bull, but that's just the reality in my mind. I mean, not just that. If you look at a very successful DAP, very successful, they're going to number in like hundreds of thousands of users a day, daily active users. For for any website or, or application, it's, it's, it's absolutely tiny. Yeah. So when did you guys decide to start adopting the term Web3? Uh, because it's all over, obviously, the website yeah. for every single chain. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, uh, you don't want to fight. You don't want to fight the trend here. If uh, if people search, you know, people are interested in this, they're going to hear about it on TV. They're going to hear about it on the media. They're going to hear about Web3. They're going to search for Web3 on Google. And, you know, we want them to find all the Web3 projects on Tezos. So hence, you know, Web3 all over the, uh, the website. There's no point in being the pedant in the room saying, also, I think it's not a bad, it's, it's not a bad term I, for it's it. It's one I, of the best. I, I, it's it's <laughs> actually one of the few decent terms I think that we've come up with in this space, to be honest. I, I, I just I just don't like when people take it too seriously as if it's like, you know, been established for the past 10 years. It's like, of course, you know, we need Web3 engineers, not Web2 engineers. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, they're just engineers, man. <laughs> yeah, dude, where do you get your degree in Web three engineering? By the way, <laughs> we need, we but, want you we want you to have ten years of experience in Web three development, and <laughs> but you literally see those things, right? I mean, it's, oh yeah, it's kind yeah, of yeah, a yeah, meme yeah. and a joke to say it, but people really view it that way. Absolutely, yeah. So, and one of the biggest, I think, problems in the space right now, obviously, is that most people are not clear as to how they can operate in the United States because of regulation and Mm -hmm. the utter lack of clarity on regulation. You guys have actually already sort of been down the unregistered security path to some degree, right? Can you talk about what happened in the past? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't some people allege we went on that path. I don't, I don't agree with that. Right. I'm, uh, not, yeah, I'm just saying, but... right. That That's fair to say. Can it, that's why yeah, I'm not sure, asking like, you to, to, to explain it. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, five, 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 five years ago, uh, there were a few lawsuits filed by, uh, believe it or not, the guy, the, the guy filing a lawsuit is currently in jail. Uh, he's serving a 10-year sentence for raping a 12-year-old. Um, so that's a person who sued us. Uh, and yeah, you know, they, they dragged this for a few years. They didn't have anything. We settled it because it was frankly costly and a distraction. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you, you read the press, they, they, they make it look a uh, Quite different yeah. than what it actually was. But, yeah, but I, didn't mean, a, to, I didn't mean to imply that, that that it was actually successful. I was just saying that you've obviously were one of the first to even have to deal with that narrative in the, in this space. Yeah. And now that's becoming the prevailing nar- narrative. And, and so do you operate with any fear of regulation in the United States or you're separate, you're going to keep on building and it doesn't even matter? I mean, you know, uh, the main thing that the, so from, Point of view is this foundation. The main thing we do is we fund different entities that do software development. Uh, by and large, software development is uh, is not something that is heavily regulated, yeah. and that is you know that is essentially what we do. Uh, also, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm based in London, so the the the, the, the Tezos Foundation is based in uh, uh, in Switzerland. So, you know, regulation in uh, in the US matters insofar as it affects what users can do on a Tezos blockchain and what uh, developers and builders can do on uh, on a chain. But we ourselves are not, you know, particularly bears in the US. Yeah, you talk about the fact that software generally is not affected by regulation. But we just saw the tornado cash saga come to the forefront. I have to imagine that was at least slightly eye-opening or concerning. Oh, it is definitely concerning, and I'm glad that there are lawsuits being filed against the Treasury because yes. I think they are not acting legally when uh, when 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 in doing this. Uh, I think it's I think it's tricky for regulators because they have yet to understand that some things are software and not entities. And you know they're saying like, yes, you know, tornado cash will. It's not a person. It's not an entity. It's not. A, it's a thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, it's the same as saying that a criminal made a call on an iPhone, we should take away iPhones. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it really is that absurd if you dig into it, but I don't think that the uh, regulator is going to understand that nuance and it's going to probably and, and, take a while to play out. And I think, you know, I mean, you know, like this is a stab in the dark, of course, I'm not, uh, I, but my guess, you might think like, of course, they know it's not an entity, but they are going to pretend it's an entity to try to apply the law or they argue that for them it's indistinguishable. But I don't even believe that's the case. I, I, I believe there are people who are genuinely like confused about this because we saw some tweets so from, from people there and they're saying that, you know, Tornado Cash is a hacking group. They're, they're literally clueless. 
They, they literally, I think they literally think it is an entity. I tend to agree. And you talked about how the Tezos Foundation effectively is funding development on the blockchain and companies that are building things and different platforms and projects. That means you get the first sort of view into what's being built and what the future of blockchain and crypto looks like. Is there anything specific maybe that hasn't gone mainstream yet or that we're not seeing, or it could be something that is, that's really exciting to you? Oh, there's a lot of things. Um, on the core side, I'm quite excited about this because I'm an engineer at heart and uh, all the work that's going on in terms of building rollups inside the protocol, building that availability sampling. So it's what we talked about, the so trilemma and scaling. I like to say that Tezos you know, had um, three uh, main pillars, smart contract language security, proof of stake and governance. And right now we're seeing a new pillar being built, which is scaling. Uh, and I think Tezos has not been known as the scaling chain. And I think that's going to change uh, with the next year. I, I think we'll, we'll actually be known for scaling. So that's a uh, that's a cool thing that's really really exciting. But of course, it's under the hood. In terms of what's more uh, more visible uh, for users' perspective, I see a lot of games being built on Tezos, uh, and I'm quite excited about that. We had uh, a lot of art application uh, in 2021. I think by and large, the art space is on uh, is on Tezos. The best artists are minting on Tezos. It's super cool to see. And then we're seeing some crossovers, like artists building games or games using art assets, and uh, that that's a I think an extremely promising direction. It's also culturally relevant. Uh, today's video game industry is bigger than even movies or, or or music, and I think the quality of the game, especially on the blockchain, has not really been there. We've seen a lot of basically Ponzi schemes or or, or forms of gambling, but not actual compelling games being built um, with uh, true um, Web three uh, tie in, and and seeing that I think is uh, uh, is super exciting and fascinating. Yeah, certainly the quality of games being built on the blockchain have not been up to par with the Fortnites and Calls of Duty of the world, but I think it's early. But a lot of people sort of believe that GameFi is the killer app for blockchains, right? That 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 is, if we can crack that market, then that's it. Do you agree? Well, it depends what we mean by FI, right? If, if what we're talking about is like, there's a game and then we have a yield farm. No, I don't no. agree. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no. If what we're talking about is like, there's a game, there's an economy around the game and the economy is, you know, powered on, is run on a decentralized platform, then yes. Uh, but there has to be an economy. Like at the end of the day, the blockchain tie-in needs to bring something to the game experience. Now it could be different things. It could be you reward creators for creating artistic content uh, or creative content that they put in the game. Uh, you reward people for playing convincing characters. You reward people because uh, you are, you know, you, you, you're betting on a game of skill, for example. So all of these aspects can, are things can make a game more fun. You know, if you play poker, poker is more fun when you bet money than when you're not betting money. So there's an interesting fun component in the bet. When you play a game like Axie Infinity, the fact that there are people being paid to farm it does not make the game more fun. And it's like, well, it's more fun because I don't have to do it. Yeah, but then you've just added some uh, some arbitrary task in the game to to justify uh, uh, a token. So as long as it adds to fun, Second Life is a great example. Second Life had you know the first, uh, uh, well, I don't know if it's about the search first, but it had a virtual economy and a virtual currency way before uh, cryptocurrencies. And there was an economy. You would uh, create 3D models, sell them in a game. Uh, you would have some form of IP ownership. You would get tokens. So that existed, and that's a model that's been proven that we haven't really seen yet uh, in uh, crypto. So if it was proven in Second Life and it existed without a blockchain, mm -hmm. is the idea that the blockchain can take it out of that game and make it real world value as opposed to just being inside the ecosystem. I mean, is that the killer app? Yes, I think so. I mean, you know, you could trade your Linden dollars back for dollars, but it was, you know, it was on eBay. It wasn't very convenient. Um, the fact that you can plug into a global network um, that can trade, that can exchange value, adds something. And some, you know, sometimes even for a lot of applications, people will say, well, you could do that with a centralized database. And the answer is like, well, well, maybe, but which you know, which centralized database today exists that is available worldwide and that can cover these use cases and people come up short, so. Yeah, I guess it gives us sort of a chicken and the egg problem because as you alluded to, game gaming market is huge, bigger than movies, like bigger than sports. It's one of the biggest entertainment markets in the world. Does that mean that we should be 
starting again from scratch and building fresh games on blockchain? Or should we be attacking the Fortnites of the world and bringing a blockchain element to that so that the existing economies there can then bring that value outside of the game? Or is it well, you, yeah, you will. You, you want to do a you want to do a, a pincher, right? So you want to do both. And there's two major gaming studios that did anything with blockchains and NFT in 2021. Uh, those were CCP Games, which had NFTs for EVE Online, and Ubisoft, and both did it on Tezos. Right. And so that begs the next question, why Tezos? Why are they choosing that? And then to continue on to that, how do you woo the best developers and the best projects to your blockchain versus another? Or is that something that's happening organically? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of both. I would say the reason to choose Tezos is stability. The network has been running for a long time. Uh, it's been stable for a long time. It's proof of stake. Uh, the decentralization, it's no, you know, it's not, you're, you're not playing in someone else's private blockchain or private database. So there's actually the idea that people will have, you know, we, do, we don't have, there's no entity that has a control of the, uh, of the chain. And if you look at the other blockchains out there, there's very, very few that can have this, this properties. There's Ethereum, I would say it's fairly decentralized, but um, it didn't have proof of stake. And also the fees are extremely uh, uh, expensive. So that made Tezos quite appealing in uh, uh, in this area. Really good developer tools. Uh, the developer tooling came late, but it's now very high quality. And the engineers who work on integration really love using some of the languages that we had to uh, to develop smart contracts. The ability to do formal verification. So it's really a set of uh, of things that come uh, that come together. I think we've been good at uh, vuing in general uh, larger businesses to build on Tezos. There's a push. That's coming. Uh, that that started, um, I would say, a few months ago, and that's coming to the next year, to push more grassroots developers, like really a broad base of the developers through hackathons, uh, incubators, to build more applications on Tezos, so that we have the other other side of the equation as well. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And when everything is operating to scale, does the competition come down to you know thousands of transactions per second or fractions of a penny in expenses, or does it really not get to that point? I think it will get to that point in terms of the transactions. Um, you see, today we consider that a, a transaction that costs a few pennies is cheap. But if you're, it depends what you're building on it. If you're trying to have millions of transactions uh, between millions of users, even pennies are going to start adding up. Especially if you want, if you don't want your user to pay for it, if you want to be subsidizing it, all of a sudden you launch your game and and you're spending thousands or tens of thousands a day just to power the thing. That gets really expensive. Um, so I think it will matter, but of course, below a certain floor, it stops being the uh, the relevant uh, the relevant case, and it's more about developer tooling infrastructure. I also think that in terms of um, in terms of network effect, there are some that exist, uh, but people tend to overestimate the importance of the crypto communities. I would say which exist around blockchains, because at the end of the day, if you're a game, you're building you're bringing your own users, right? You're going to build a game. You want to attract millions of users. Your users are not necessarily going to be the people who happen to own the token on the platform that you're building. They are people who want to play your game. And with a good UX, it shouldn't matter. Like in, with a good UX, basically you can uh, provide easy wallet onboarding. You can provide easy un uh, fiat onboarding. All of these is available today uh, and abstract away the blockchain. I think Some, what you just yeah. described is literally the key to adoption, right? Like... You're at, we might care and your ETH Maxi or your Tezos Maxi or your Solana Maxi might be super passionate about where it's built. But yeah. your average person who just wants to play a game, if they never hear the word blockchain, we've done our job right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do we get to a point with UX UI where that is the case, right? Because I would argue right now that that's the biggest barrier to entry for most people. They just find it daunting, intimidating. They don't understand it. Yeah. There's a couple of things. I would say probably the biggest obstacle is... Uh, the wallet, uh, because anytime you install installing a wallet by itself is already a lot. You know, like you, you you have to imagine you see some websites that optimize to not ask you for your email or to 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 have the shortest sign up form so that they don't lose anyone on sign up. I don't know. Have you noticed a trend now when you, you go to a website you can't even find the login button? They just have yeah. a sign up button and they hide the login yep. button. All right. So they, they they optimize the shit out of this, and then you're trying to build a uh, a blockchain. It's like, well, first you go out and you install a wallet. That's already bad. And then you install the wallet, and then you say, well, here's some cryptographic key material. Don't put it. Don't even don't even think of putting it into your uh your your paste bin. Just write it down and put it in a safe deposit box. This is this is you know the thing to do, but it's also a horrible user experience. 
So we have to be able to get past that. And hopefully we have to be able to get past that without falling into the other side, which is say, well, we'll just have completely custodial wallets where right. the game is going to take care of your of your assets with possibility of offboarding. There's a good um, in between that's popular in this ecosystem, which is to use um, social uh, uh, social sign on. So you basically use your Twitter account or your Gmail account, and that controls your key. So it's non-custodial, but also if you have one of these uh, social media accounts, you have direct access. It's I think it's an interesting trade-off. That's the first one, and the second thing is fees. You don't want people to have to go. And KYC them, you know, like okay, you pay with a credit card. First, pass this KYC test so you can buy five, so you can get five bucks, so you can pay for your transaction fees. Those are the yeah. two main things. If you if you get rid of that, uh, you've smoothed out the experience a lot. So, we obviously know the history and where we are at this point. In your grandest vision, if everything works out perfectly and everything you're building becomes adopted mainstream, what does the future look like five, ten years for Tezos? Uh, well, the future looks like tens of millions of users uh, uh, every day on a, on a chain, not necessarily knowing that they're using Tezos, but having heard of Tezos nonetheless. Uh, and uh, with all sorts of application uh, from gaming to finance, uh, art, and other categories, hopefully, I'm hoping that it's not, you know, there's a thing about uh, hiding the blockchain in some sense. I'm hoping that there's some cross pollination in a sense that when you are on a Tezos ecosystem, you've played a game and now you want to use some other application. You want to collect a piece of art. Maybe you want to uh, uh, to get a loan. You know, you're already part of the ecosystem. So you have kind of this uh, this ability to do this in the same sense that, you know, if you if you have a uh, today a Google account, then it's easy to use different type of application in the same ecosystem. Or if you have a mobile phone and you have access to a series of application. So you, you don't want to hide it completely. You want you want people to come in your ecosystem and and and, 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 and cross pollinates between <laughs> yes. applications. Absolutely, but you still don't want to be in your face saying like you are now using a blockchain. Wait for the next block for your transaction to sure. be included and all that. Yeah, I, I asked you this question before, and you obviously gave scalability as the answer, but you just kind of talked about NFTs, art, gaming, metaverse. Is there something that's coming that we're not thinking about at all? Obviously, we're seeing, you know, play to earn, walk to earn, breathe to earn, everything to earn. Is that the next iteration? Or is there something wild that's being built that has not even made it yet to the mainstream no, at all? I don't believe in the, uh, I don't believe a lot. So I think that if you want to earn something, you have to be providing something. So again, if you're, you know, if, 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 if you're earning money playing poker, you're providing, you know, players for the, for, for the other side. But also it's, it's based on the illusion that some some people think that that, that, that they're going to win uh or if you are you know creating new 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 visual assets for a game then you can earn something but the idea is that you're going to do something that provides value to no one and still earn money is nonsense and is you know is not is not absolutely absolutely not sustainable so i don't think the future is to earn even though there may be uh money making opportunities there may be you know like work opportunities that that that, that happen it's not like the the killer use case is not make money Right, and it can on be interesting. That's funny because I saw one recently that was a platform being built that was volunteer to earn money, and I thought, isn't that just working? <laughs> well, do work to, to earn. do work to earn money. The killer app for cryptocurrencies, but it, <laughs> really, it's 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 really full circle. <laughs> it, it is so, but that's actually the first time I've heard someone be somewhat dismissive of it, and your argument makes a ton of sense. It really I does. Mean, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, someone has to be paying for it on the other side. <laughs> that is right, like, so like, how does that economy really work? Mm -hmm. You know, what is, what is in it? But they're collecting your data, presumably, is what they care about, right? I don't, I, I think a lot of, I, I think a lot of what powers the economy uh, today is like the, 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 the earning comes from printing tokens. And what gives value to the token being printed is people buying it to speculate. So that's basically like people earn from the inflation and then they earn from people who hold it because the speculate is going to go up. That's that's a, that's a dynamic. Uh, I think a few generations of this and people are going to get a bit jaded with, uh, with those mechanisms and learn that they don't really work. Isn't that effectively what uh, Bitcoin was created to <laughs> hedge against in the first place? There are different views of Bitcoin and um, certainly I think it's interesting as a store of value. But when Bitcoin first came out, the thing that really excited me about it was the permissionless aspect, the idea of being able to make uh, permissionless cross-border payments because it opened the possibility of doing international finance. So when I first saw Bitcoin, I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic because now you can create a stock exchange you know, in the Seychelles or in the Bahamas 
and then have people and then you know you get and, and then you're not going to be blocked by the you're not going to be dependent on the banking system for people to get to go in or out which means you can really be independent because the banking system has been used um in the past to basically do some form of uh, extra jurisdictional enforcement or yeah. um censorship or or use cartels, yeah. you know, between countries. Yeah. So that's that. That my thought was a was a Bitcoin use case. And then you saw, for example, there was Bitmex, basically, you know, try to uh, ha- had a little bit of this model and, uh, and others. I think the model is is a little flawed, and the reason being that the United States considers that if you had a Burger King once in transit in Atlanta, then your entire business is based in the United States, uh, or at least that's what they'll do. And most of the world will will enforce a court decision even based on those flimsy premises. So unfortunately, it means that the, the, the idea of being a centralized solution that's offshore and uses Bitcoin for payments is not going to not going to work. And I think that's what Satoshi envisioned uh, uh, initially. Hence, the importance of smart contracts, uh, decentralized organization, and pushing the decentralization further into the stack of what you uh, of what you build. So it all comes back to regulators in the United States government. Wonderful, it does. Everything seemingly comes back to that as the biggest impediment to adoption and growth. I mean, yeah, there's two kind of people in cryptocurrency when they look at the banks, and and some of them are going to say like it's great because, you know, the the because banks are evil and we don't have to depend on the, on 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 the banks. And the other way to look at it is that you know banks are not banks are not evil, but they're forced to be, and Bitcoin is not forced to be uh, is not forced to be evil. Well, we'll take whatever narrative we can get mm-hmm. at this point. I would say, and here, sure. here in the depths of the <laughs> in the depths of the bear market. So, any final thoughts before I let you go? I know we're up against time, but where can people uh, check it out? What would you say to developers who are looking to build something new? Uh, absolutely. So, check out the uh, the Tezos Developer Portal on Tezos.com. Uh, and there's a lot of tons of information on the, on the website Tezos.com. Uh, if you can also follow me, if you want, on Twitter, I'm uh, at. Uh, Arthur B. And of course, there's the uh, Tezos handle at T uh, T E Z O S. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a great conversation. And you definitely uh, made me think and left me with a few surprises that were different than what I've heard from uh, founders of other projects. So I really appreciate the perspective and, and you taking the time to share. My pleasure, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.